Welcome to South Hills. My name is Adam and this is my wife. Gretchen. We are the campus pastors here at our South Hills Corona campus. We are so glad that you decided to join us, but we also realize that not everybody goes to church every single week. This may be your first time at this church or at this type of church. And so we just wanted to begin by giving you a little bit of what to expect from your experience here at South Hills. As you walk onto the campus, you'll probably notice there's a station that has donut holes and coffee and water and tea. And you might be wondering, who is this for? It is for you, and it's all free. The coffee is delicious, is. and we taste yes. tested the donuts. We did. We took it very seriously. We went to like all the donut places. These are the best ones. And if you brought a child with you today, I highly encourage you to check out the children's ministry. It is so fun. Each classroom has crafts and games and worship and teaching. But then they break down into these smaller groups where they get to talk and be listened to and cared for by an adult who knows their name and is interested in their story. Once you've grabbed your coffee and donuts and checked your kids in, you'll move into the auditorium and you can sit wherever you want to. There are no assigned seats here. We also have the full service live streaming in real time that you can watch from the cafe, from the lobby, or even the parents' room that's right off the lobby. We'll begin our service with a time of worship, which is a churchy way of saying we're going to sing songs together about who God is and his love for us. And we want to encourage you to stand and clap and participate. And you don't have to have all the words memorized. We will have them all on the screen for you to follow along. One thing you'll notice about our band is that they're very passionate and energetic, which means they can sometimes get kind of loud. And so if it's a little bit too much for you, there are earplugs in the lobby available upon request. Then we're going to give everybody an opportunity to give with us. We may even tell you some stories about how your giving is impacting our community and rippling out and even transforming the world at large. Then we're going to share with you some events and activities coming up right around the corner, but you don't even have to wait for that. You could jump on the Church Center app and check it out for yourself. Then someone will be out to share a message from the Bible in a way that is hopefully interesting and relevant to whatever you're going through right now. And I encourage you to get something out to take notes, whether it's the note sheet provided for you or the notes app in your phone. There's going to be something that stands out to you today that you're going to want to remember. And although we take scripture very seriously, we don't take ourselves that seriously. So if something strikes you as funny, feel free to laugh along and enjoy yourself. At the end of the message, we will have a brief time of prayer and we hope that it ends up being an hour that is exciting and fun and interesting and inspiring. And that it's something that after you leave, you look forward to coming back and experiencing with us again. If you have any questions about anything during your time here, Drop by the big connect counter sign in the lobby and there's someone there that can answer any question that you might have. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoyed this service.
a rusty spoon, a blue marble, a broken shard of porcelain, a collection connected only by where it was found, unearthed with a butter knife from my backyard. In the mind of an eight-year-old pirate, anything buried is treasure. How did all this stuff find its way into the ground behind our house? The elements grow envious for what we took from them. My grandmother used to say softly, wind blows and rain pours and soil shifts. The weather whips through and conceals without consent. Storms are sneaky that way. Treasures disappear in the downpour. That's why when you hear thunder in the distance, we run out to pull in what we love but left behind. But we don't always get there in time. Most of my storms came as a surprise. I was blindsided by betrayal, devastated by diagnosis, sucker punched by sadness. And each new storm that blows in brings loss. Vital bits of you break off and burrow. And when you look at the weather-torn landscape of your life, all you see is what's gone, what's missing, what used to be. And you think to yourself, I can't do this again. I can't survive any more surprises. But even as the words leave your lips, you sense something stirring on the horizon. Your stomach tightens. What sort of traumatic turret awaits you? Even though you know all weather isn't bad and not all surprises are sinister, what if instead of another storm, what's concealed in the clouds above is a gentle rain, a baptism of hope, what if what's coming isn't more darkness, but the light of the unrelenting love of the divine, of the one who whispers to the storm, peace, be still, hope is here. I am with you always. Any time, any place, any pain, your love will never change through the highs, through the lows. Never quit, never fail Your love will never change In my doubts, in my chains Your love will never change Happy Easter, South Hill. So good to see you. Why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet? We're going to sing and celebrate all that Jesus has done for us. Come on, let's do it. Change my vision. I want to see you. Give me meaning and direction. Let me live in your perfection. Cause there's no one I could run to with chaos overwhelming. You're the one. Let's declare, where could I go?
of his name just a mention of his name just a mention of his name everything can change come on let's declare this morning if you walked in heaven you're gonna walk out light if you walked in weary you're gonna be alright it's just a mention of his name just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Everything Come on, God change. wants to encourage you this morning. If you walk in town, you're gonna walk out of. If you walk in empty, he's gonna fill your cup. Cause a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name, everything can change, everything can change. If you walk in broken, you're gonna walk out whole. If you walk in lost, he's gonna save your soul. Just a mention of his name, just a mention of his name, just a mention of his name, everything can change. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Everything can change. Everything can change. It's just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. It's just a mention of his name. Everything can change. His name is Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Power to break strongholds. Power for freedom, deliverance. Come on, just receive that today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've broken chains. Thank you that you're strong and powerful. That your ways are mighty. That you're in control. Come on, let's declare. If you walked in sin. You're going to walk out here. If you walked in bow, you're going to walk out free. If you walked in heavy, you're going to walk out light. If you walked in weary, you're going to be all right. If you walked in down, you're going to walk out. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. 
Surrounding me, let it burn at your name. Still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still. Every wave at your name, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Silence Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, call these bones to live, call these lungs to see.
Cooper, and I have been attending South Hills for about a year now at the Costa Mesa campus. So Izzy, okay. tell me tell me how you first found South Hills Church. Um, I actually found South Hills Church on Instagram because it was around Easter and I saw a ad for a dog Easter egg hunt. To be honest, I didn't really know it was a church. I was not looking for a church, um, but I went and I met so many kind and welcoming people who invited me to Easter service. I had just gone through the worst breakup of my life. I was in the very beginning stages of getting a divorce. Um, so I was just at a, such a low point in my life where I felt so worthless. I felt unlovable and quite frankly, I felt like I had no one and nothing. For some reason, I woke up the next day and decided to go. I walked into the building. I didn't feel uncomfortable. Um, I felt so welcomed. They recognized me, which was so nice. They actually remembered my name. I felt at home as soon as I walked in the door. I was looking for community. So I felt like I had found what I was looking for and I wanted to be a part of that. I knew it was time to take that next step of committing my life to God. My divorce finalized on February 19th this year. And I was like, if, if South Hills decides the 18th is Baptism Sunday, I'm getting baptized. Lo and behold, that Sunday was Baptism Sunday. So I was like, okay, I hear you, God. I hear you loud and clear. It's time. If you're gonna give someone advice of that's you know listening to your story, but what would you say to them? You get what you put into it. The more that I pour into my relationship with God, the more I see what he's given me, and the more I realize I don't even know how much he loves me. What do you think is next? I feel God calling me to share my story with others and help others know and understand the love he has for us. I think you just have to take that first step. Uh, it brought me so much peace. It brought me freedom. And it taught me what love should actually be. What an incredible story. And that's what I love about South Hills, is that every week we get to hear stories like Izzy's of people's lives that are being changed and transformed. And so much of the reason that it's possible for Izzy and everyone else to come and be a part, to come and see what God is doing is because of the people who call South Hills home, who faithfully give. And if you are a first time guest with us this morning, I do not want you to feel any pressure to give. This service is our gift to you. But if you call South Hills your home, or maybe you call it home, but you only come on holidays, so you're like, I have some making up to do. We want to invite you to give. And there's so many different ways you can give here. We have buckets that are being passed around. We also have wooden towers by the doors in the back. You can give online, on the Church Center app, or whatever way works best for you. But from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for making it possible for stories like Izzy's and everyone else's to happen. Will you pray with me over our giving? God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today together, to learn about you, to celebrate what you've done. And God, I thank you that you are a generous God, that you meet our needs, that you meet the needs of people that we don't even know. God, I thank you that you provide for us and that in turn, you ask us to help provide for others. I pray that you would use everything we give you to meet the needs of the people in our community to further your kingdom. And God, may we be generous the way you are generous. In your name we pray, amen. My name is Gretchen, and I'm the Next Steps Director here at South Hills Corona. Happy Easter, and we're so glad that you chose to join us today, whether you're with us in person or online. 
If you're new with us, we hope you feel welcome. And there's just one thing we want to ask of you today to fill out a connect card that asks for three simple pieces of information. And you can find these blue teal cards in the back of the chair in front of you. Your card can be turned in after service at the connect counter in the lobby for a Starbucks gift card. And if you're new and watching online, click the link in our bio or in the chat to fill out your connect card from there. We're glad you're here on Easter and maybe you're wondering what else there is that you can get involved with. Well, registration opens today for our women's event on May 4th, and it's going to be a great time to connect with other women and learn and grow together. We've also opened registration for Extreme Week, our on-campus summer kids camp. You can find out more information about the women's event and Extreme Week on the Church Center app. It is the best way to stay connected at South Hills, and you can use the Church Center app to give, join a small group, or even check your kids in on a Sunday. You can stop by the Connect counter in the lobby for details on how to download and use the Church Center app. You might be thinking those things are a little far out. The biggest thing that you can do right now is to come back next week for Bounce Back Sunday, where there will be tons of fun for all ages with a bounce house, bouncy balls, and a huge inflatable obstacle course. We believe one of the best habits you can make in your life is being connected to a local faith community. We hope to see you right back here next Sunday and that you have an incredible Easter today. Good morning. Happy Easter. Thank you so much for being with us here on Easter. Uh, my name is Adam, and I'm the campus pastor here at our Corona campus. And, uh, man, we are so excited that you braved the weather and made your way here because we all know Californians are a little bit afraid of rain. And uh, you guys did it. You made it, and we couldn't be prouder of you. And uh, we hope that today um, gives you hope. We hope that today uh, hits you right where you live, where you're at, and that you walk out of here with the sense that um, God is with and for you. Uh, today we're going to jump into the message in just a moment, but uh, before that, I just wanted to acknowledge a couple things. One, um, today we had a uh, guest worship leader, my buddy Chris Mistrick from Arizona. Didn't he do an incredible <laughs> job? So phenomenal. Uh, pastor JR, who is our worship pastor, is uh, out with his wife uh, uh, on maternity leave with their brand new baby girl. And uh, Chris agreed to come in and uh, just did such a phenomenal job. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, all of the things that have been happening over the course of this weekend, Good Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, are all possible because of volunteers, uh, because people have decided to serve and get involved. And uh, in fact, it takes 236 separate volunteers to pull off this weekend. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all of our volunteers who made everything happen from kids ministry cameras, uh, all of the things, the cleaning that went in. I also want to give a shout out to our Next Steps director, Gretchen, who coordinated all those volunteers. We did such an incredible job. And, uh, and she's also my wife. So she's very, very thankful for her on multiple levels. I just wanted to squeeze that in. More for me than you, but I wanted to get that in. Um, well, today we are going to jump into a message uh, about Easter, and I want to encourage you to take some notes. Maybe that's not something you're used to doing, uh, but it will help you retain what is happening here today. And my hope isn't this that you feel inspired or encouraged or you learn some information, but that you're able to grab hold of something that you can take home with you and have conversations about that maybe over lunch today, instead of getting into politics, dear Jesus, right? You could talk about something that happened here and how it's hitting your life and whether you or not you even agree with it um, and uh, dive a little bit deeper and maybe apply something into the way that you live. And if you're taking notes today, the title of my message is Slip and Slides, Suckers and Cynics. Slip and Slides, Suckers and Cynics. For those of you that it's your first time, welcome. <laughs> when I was a kid, um, we had this ritual on Saturday morning. This is a time before the internet and before like anything was on demand. So you had to wait for the good cartoons on Saturday. Anybody remember this? And that was the day where my parents, who were very strict about what we were allowed to eat during the week, let us have unlimited sugar cereal. 
it was glorious. And uh, we were smart too because we were allowed to have one bowl, but the size of the bowl was never dictated. And so we would dig and we would find the biggest mixing bowl we could find and pour like a whole <laughs> box of cereal in there and just eat out of it. And uh, I don't know if anybody else did that for just the fat kids in the Smith family, but we loved it. It was how we lived, and we watched these cartoons, and uh, we knew exactly which was coming on. And the thing of it was, you didn't want to, to leave once the, the block started, because you wanted to hit all the cartoons and the commercials. The commercials were key, because all the commercials were about toys and things you wanted. And it was the only time I ever saw advertising, really. Uh, things have changed a little bit, right? And, and so everything that I saw, I wanted, and there were certain things I wanted more than others. And the thing I couldn't, felt like I couldn't live without, and I don't know if you remember this, but it was something called the Crocodile Mile. Anybody remember this thing right here? It was basically a slip and slide. This commercial was on all the time, and basically the idea was that you would run down the slip and slide, and it seemed like it was like, a, like a, literally a mile long, hence the name the crocodile mile, and you would fly down this thing, and then there was like a bump and a little pool. You'd hit the bump and go through the crocodile's mouth and land in the little kiddie pool, and I was like, this is going to make all my summer dreams come true, and I asked my parents, and they were like, no, we're not getting it. We're poor, and so I was like, man, but then I found out a couple weeks later that some kids down the street had gotten one, and we never really liked them, but we decided we were wrong about that, <laughs> and... We went down there, and we're like, we heard you guys got a crocodile. We got to confirm first, right? We heard you guys got a crocodile mile. They're like, we did. And we're like, we, we feel like we've misjudged you. And um, we would like to be friends. And so they were like just setting it up. We were so excited. We went out into the backyard where they had it set up, and we're like, we're going to do this thing. And they were like, you should go first. And I was like, I can't believe I'm going to be the one to break it in. I was so excited. And um, here's the thing I didn't realize at the time. Anytime you're a kid and you're asked to do something first, you're the guinea pig. They don't trust the situation, and they're like, this guy's dumb. He'll do it, and then we'll find out what we shouldn't do. And the thing that we discovered uh, early on was that, like, the crocodile mouth doesn't work by itself, okay? You got to hose that thing down constantly to make it work. Uh, basically, they just, like, hosed it once, shut off the hose, because their dad was all strict about water. And by the time I actually went to run down it, the heat had just sucked all that water out. And it was just hot, dry vinyl. And I didn't, we didn't know. I didn't know that this was not going to end well, right? And so I'm like, let's do this. And I go running down and I dive onto this crocodile mile. And it's just like, just, just ripping the skin off my stomach. And all my friends were there. And so I didn't want to look like a wimp. So I was just, they're like, you okay? And I was like, I feel good. I get up and they're like, you're, you're bleeding uh, from your stomach. We didn't even know that could happen. And I'm like, we need water. And so they were like, well, let's not do what he did. And so while I was, you know, just covering my entire chest with Band-Aids, <laughs> these kids started hosing that thing down. One kid got smart, went in the inside. He's like, we need to lube this thing up. And he gets some, like, Dawn dish soap, and he's just slumber all over the place. And um, the next kid is like, we're going to do it. Here we go. And so that kid winds up, he runs as fast as he can, dives on the thing. He has a different experience. He goes flying. I mean, just like, woo, right? He goes right through the, hits the bump. The thing that we didn't understand was you might not like the commercial just land in the kiddie pool. If you get enough dish soap, you will go way beyond, <laughs> which means you got to pull that thing back from any privacy fences that exist in that backyard. So the next kid goes and he's like, poof, 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 hits this wall. And we're like, ooh. And I was like, glad I went first. Man, that, that kid really paid for it. And then we're like, you know what? The third time's the charm. This is, we're gonna get it. We're gonna nail it this time. And the third kid gets up and they're so excited. You know, we, we, we redirected it away from the fence, right? Which was smart. This kid runs down and goes and like hits the bump and get, gets scared and so puts his arms out and knocks like knocks out the entire crocodile little overhang thing and because his arm is caught and he's going so fast he just rips the whole pool thing <laughs> off of it and it's just completely torn to shreds and at that point we were like ooh and I was like I got to go you know and we 
we just left. Three uses, and it was garbage. <laughs> like this thing that I had been admiring and lusting after for years on Saturday morning cartoons just was torn to bits. And also before it got trashed, it was a death trap, you guys. <laughs> and this was, I think, the first time that I had an experience where I was like, wait a minute. Not all advertising is true. This wasn't what the commercials explained. Like companies don't always keep their promises. Not everything pictured is included. There was a real crocodile in the cartoons. <laughs> they didn't have that in the box, right? Like, I, I, and I would guess that you probably had moments like this too where you got excited about something and then you got into it and you realized that man, it's not what you thought it was going to be, that not everything or everyone can be trusted. And I think the older you get, the more you see how prevalent this idea is. And you learn in life to be cautious, right? Because you have to be. And I think this is sort of the state that we're in right now because we live in a world where we're always being sold, right? Everyone around you has an agenda. They have an angle. They have a side hustle, probably three and I think for a lot of us, it, it turns us into very skeptical people, suspicious of everything. Although that's not all that we are, because there's another part of us that still wants to believe, right? That still holds on to hope, which is why even as we grow older and wiser, we can still get tricked as adults. Remember Fat Free? <laughs> We're all... They were just telling it, they're advertising, you just eat these snacks, they're fat free. You can be so skinny. And I ate so many of those snacks and I was like, I'm gaining weight. What is happening? And they were just like, don't worry, we'll replace all that fat with carbs and sugar. And then later on we were like, wait, those things make you fat, right? What about the, the, the housing market bubble of 2007, right? Where we were all like, I, I can buy a house? And they're like, absolutely. And you're like, I should, I deserve it, you know? I should be able to buy a $600,000 house with a part-time job from Wendy's. <laughs> That's how things, you know what? Um, and some people are like, is this too good to be true? And you're like, no, I'm sure that the banks can be trusted. I'm sure everything will be fine. And they couldn't, and it wasn't. And some of us lost big. And when we realize in these moments that we've been had, we think like, man, I should have known better. How could I fall for that? We feel stupid. We feel like a sucker. And we hate that feeling. We'll do almost anything to avoid it. But at the same time, we also love movies about con artists. Don't pretend like you don't. You're watching a movie about someone who is doing something that you know is wrong, and you're like, I hope they get away with it. I hope they're able to trick everybody, right? Oh, man, rob that bank, right? You remember that movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can? I loved it. Leonardo DiCaprio, and was, he's playing this guy, and he sneaks around, and, you know, he's doing all this stuff. He's flying commercial airlines without a license. He's running an ER. He is arguing cases in court. And the whole time we're like, I hope he gets away with it. Now, let's flip this around. Imagine that you were on trial for something very serious, and you had a lawyer who was only pretending to be a lawyer. Some of you are like, I feel like I have lived through that case, actually. Uh, not cool, right? That's not what we want. Because this is sort of the way that we work. We love the idea of outsmarting other people, but we hate this idea of being outsmarted. And we end up adopting mantras like, you know, don't get your hopes up. If it feels too good to be true, it probably is. If he shenans once, he'll shenan again. <laughs> that was either a, a proverb or something I saw on TikTok. I can't remember. <laughs> and there's some wisdom to all these things, right? But when they make us feel like we have to always keep our eyes peeled and we always have to keep our head on a swivel, we start to believe that the only person that I can trust is me. We become suspicious of everyone. And I think, like, is there anyone that feels more suspicious than a spiritual leader? Probably not. I mean, all of us have seen too much not to be 
pretty skeptical because so many say one thing and do another, right? We have all lived long enough to see enough so-called spiritual leaders take advantage of people and shame them and manipulate and steal money from and sleep with their followers. And we're like, no thanks. And the saddest part about this is it's not new. Religious con artists have existed ever since religion. It's been around forever. Even in the time of Jesus, there were lots of pagan cults, temples, and superstitions. And there were even plenty of failed Jewish messiahs. People that claim to be God's chosen one to lead the people into victory and make everything right. And then it didn't work out. They, they were frauds and they died and went away like everybody else. And I think for some of us, it's easy to think like, man, if I would have lived in the first century and I could walk and talk with Jesus, man, I would, it would be so much easier for me to believe. But I don't know if that's true. We think that because we know the rest of the story. But the people that are living through these moments in scripture, they don't even know they're in a story. They're just living their everyday lives. They have no idea what is coming. And I think it might be easier or have been easier to believe in Jesus after he had resurrected, but I think it would have been a lot harder to believe in him as you watched him die. Which all the original followers of Jesus did. And there were two people who had a closer view than anybody else. And it wasn't his mother, it wasn't his brothers, it wasn't his disciples, it was two strangers. It says this in Luke chapter 23, verse 32, that two criminals were led out to be executed with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. And maybe you imagine Jesus being crucified alone, that it was this big moment, but that's not how it worked because the Romans never crucified anyone alone. Crucifixions were common. And in fact, if you read through Roman history, which I'm sure a lot of you are gonna do this afternoon just for funsies, <laughs> you would discover factoids like this. In 4 BC, the Romans crucified 2,000 Jewish rebels at once in a place called Sephoris, which later became a makeup franchise. <laughs> at least the first part of that's true. In 70 AD, in 70 AD, the Romans crucified so many people at once that historians say they ran out of trees. I mean, it's astounding. This tells us that crucifixions were a common occurrence. Every man, woman, and child who grew up under the Roman Empire had seen quite a few. It was brutal. And the Romans' final insult to Jesus wasn't that they killed him. It was that they killed him in this particular way, as if to say to him, you are not special. This is what we think of you. You're not a king. You're a nobody. And that's why they crucified him between two common criminals, because they were nobodies too. They were such nobodies that we know virtually nothing about them. We don't know their names. We don't know their stories. Who they are is essentially reduced to bad people who did bad things and now deserve to die. It makes me wonder, like, what did they do and why did they do it? Did they take unfair advantage of other people who were disadvantaged? Or were they just sort of trying to do whatever they had to do to survive? Where were their family and their friends at the cross? Like, did anyone love them enough to show up for them on the worst day of their entire lives? We don't know the answers to any of these things. I imagine this mix of hurt and hatred rolling around in their hearts as they looked out at this crowd who got some sort of sick pleasure out of watching them suffer. And then the man who's being crucified between them musters all of his strength to raise himself up and fill his collapsed lungs with air so that he could say one thing to the crowd of people. And you know that the criminals are thinking, what's it gonna be? I know what I would say. And this is what Jesus says. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And I bet the two criminals thought, 
Not what I thought you were going to say. I was going to say something. It had a lot of bad words in it. It had a lot more anger in it. But Jesus is different. And in fact, this is stunning to the two criminals on the cross. They had never seen anything like this before. An innocent man being tortured, forgiving those torturing him as they're torturing him. And you would think this is so unusual and astounding that everyone would stop and notice simultaneously that the crowd would stare in silence at this unbelievably otherworldly response. But that's not the case. It says in verse 34 that the soldiers gambled for his clothes, that the crowd watched and leaders scoffed. He saved others. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah. The soldiers mocked, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And the reason they shout these things is because they believe that Jesus is just another fake. One more in a long line of failed messiahs. Men who make empty promises that there's no way they could keep. Leaders who take advantage of hurting people who desperately are looking for something, anything, to place their hope in. And this may shock you, but I think their ridicule is reasonable. When you listen to the complaint, I get it. It's logical. How are you going to save us if you can't even save yourself? Good point. One of the criminals echoes the crowd. He says, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Now, there's a word for this. For all this angst, for all this hard-heartedness, there's a word for this thing that the criminal and the crowd are experiencing, and it's called cynicism. Now, cynicism is essentially the belief that you can't trust anyone because everyone is driven by self-interest and always has ulterior motives. It's the assumption that when push comes to shove, everybody's really just going to do what's best for them and never the people around them. It's this uh, pervasive uh, pessimism that's always anxiously awaiting to be let down. It's a, a hardened hopelessness that believes that what wins in the end is humanity's most selfish impulses and worst instincts. And yet as bad and as dark as cynicism sounds, I truly believe that every cynic has a right to be cynical that it happened for a reason. If you're cynical, you're cynical because you were lied to. At some point, you were misled or taken advantage of. You were wounded or hurt or betrayed. And that protective part of your psyche rose up within you and said, never again. Never again. But I gotta tell you, just because you have a right to something doesn't make it good for you. I think oftentimes we find ourselves being cynical because we feel like it's safer than the alternative. And what is the alternative to cynicism? Vulnerably facing our fears and fragility, admitting that we aren't invincible, that others have the ability to hurt us, that we can be taken advantage of, that we don't always know what we're doing, even when we're giving it our best shot, that everything that we don't like and think is unfair isn't everybody else's fault. And that no matter how hard we try, we don't have the ability to fix what is broken about us. I mean, we can't can't admit that. That's crazy. And so we insulate ourselves from being hurt further by walling ourselves off and hurting alone in isolation. All the while projecting that, you know, I'm fine. You know, I'm strong. I'm good. We got this. But we don't. And this criminal, I think, mocks Jesus because he can't believe that anyone could have the power or the ability to save themselves and choose instead to suffer for everyone else. Jesus does not make sense to cynics because cynics try to save themselves by outsmarting and outmaneuvering everyone around them. But Jesus He saved everyone everywhere by loving and laying down his life for all who hurt him. 
And when a cynic looks on Jesus, they can't understand the motivation because it's not self-driven. It's driven by love. And the criminal on the other side of Jesus sees this and he confronts the, 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 the cynical criminal two crosses down. He says, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. This criminal, he, he softens just long enough to notice what nobody else seems to, that there is something very different about Jesus. That the worst things imaginable have happened to him, but it hasn't shaken his compassion for or love of humanity. And this is, by the way, the reason that, that Christians have never believed that bad things don't happen to good people. We believe the worst thing happened to the best person who endured it, overcame it, and grew something beautiful from it for the sake of everyone else. Maybe this criminal who defends Jesus had heard some of the stories about Jesus healing the blind or feeding the 5,000 or casting out demons or raising Lazarus from the dead, but I don't think he needed to. What he saw Jesus do from the cross that day was enough because I think there's no greater miracle than loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you and forgiving those who betray you, even as they continue to inflict pain on you. Some of you are like, that would be a miracle. I would rather try and raise myself from the dead <laughs> than have to do that. That's not even a miracle I want to be a part of. And yet this is why Jesus is so astounding in this moment. This moment is what convinces this criminal that Jesus is more than a man. Because this is not something you can do in human strength. And he speaks up and he pleads with Jesus Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what we don't hear that the original audience would have is the similarity between what this man is pleading with Jesus and an Old Testament prayer prayed by King David. David says this in Psalm chapter 25, verse 7. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful. You know what mercy is? Mercy is when someone has the right to come down hard on you, but instead they do not give you what you deserve. They give you something better. And David is admitting to God, I am messed up. I'm broken. I've done some bad things. And some of those bad things I did because bad things were done to me. I hurt other people out of my hurt, often unintentionally. But don't, when you think about me, don't remember that. Remember that I am more than just that. It's as if this criminal on the cross is saying to Jesus, Jesus, I believe that you are the King, the Christ, the Messiah, and I have sinned, but I'm more than my sins. The world wants to tell me that all I am are my worst moments, but I know that you are loving and you are merciful. Remember me for who I really am. The person you created me to be. The person I truly am on the inside before the world jaded me. He's saying to Jesus, like, don't give up on me yet. A man who is taking his last few breaths, who doesn't really have the opportunity to make amends for his wrong. He's like, Jesus, don't give up on me yet. Jesus replies to him, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. I think we, we tend to think of paradise as a place and it may be partially but it's more than that. I, I think paradise isn't as much a place we go to as a person who came to us. To believe that Jesus is with and for you, no matter what you're going through or where you're at in life, is to experience paradise. And you've seen this. You've seen people who are in the worst 
impossible situation, and yet they have peace and joy. And you realize something otherworldly is going on in them. And after Jesus says this to the man, all three men on the cross die. But three days later, the man in the middle comes back to life. This is the ultimate twist of all twists. I don't know uh, how much you guys have done research on this. Not a lot of people come back to life (laughs) after they die. It's a very rare occurrence. And people realize that Jesus isn't a fake, that he could be trusted, that their hope wasn't wasted on him. And they begin to believe that in Jesus, anything is possible for anyone, including tax collectors and prostitutes and criminals on a cross. One New Testament author later wrote this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can brag about it. And then he says this, for we are God's masterpiece. I know that maybe for some of you, there is this fear inside of you. Maybe it's part of the fear that keeps you away from church in general. Most Sundays, you have this fear that when God looks at you, that all he sees is disappointment and anger over the worst things that you've done that you wish you could take back, but you can't. But the New Testament tells us that when God looks at you, what he sees is a masterpiece. He sees his creation. He sees what he made and loves and was willing to die for, even though when he died for you, you may never turn back to him. It was still worth it. What this criminal asked for, God graciously gives to all of us. He remembers you. Not for your wrongdoing or your worst moments, but for the person that he made you to be and loves unconditionally. And this is why we keep telling and retelling the Easter story. Every year my kids are like, what, 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 what are you going to preach on Easter? And I'm like, I mean, it's the same story. It's the, you know, we're not really allowed to add m- many twists, you know. Maybe this year he doesn't come back. I don't know. I'm just, is that, no, that's, that's wrong, that's bad. We keep telling it not because it's new, but because it's powerful and true. And we believe that the power of the resurrection isn't just that God brought Jesus back to life, but that God can bring anything back to life, including what cynicism killed in you. Your dreams, your future, your relationships, your sense of safety and security, your ability to experience joy or believe that anything good could be waiting for you up ahead. And the more we open ourselves up to this, the more cynicism loses its hold on our hearts and and, and we can let go of all of our hiding and striving. And we can surrender to the only one who is truly trustworthy. And that's what salvation feels like. You see, the difference between these two thieves dying on the cross with Jesus is not the horrible things that they did or the horrible things that were done to them. It was their responses to those things. And that's what sets any of us apart. These two thieves are not just a picture of two people. It's a picture of two paths that all of us have the opportunity to choose to take. Because the truth is, life is hard. And we're all imperfect. Maybe you don't want to hear this, but suffering is inevitable. It will happen. And skepticism is understandable. But we get to choose whether we embrace cynicism or experience salvation through surrender. These two men on the cross got that choice and you have the same one. And I think for some of you, the reason why you ended up here today was to be positioned at this crossroads to look in the mirror of your own life and realize that you have the same decision to make. And up to this point, 
everything that happened to you and everything you did that you don't like to survive what happened to you has made you so cynical. And it has kept you from a lot of pain. It's also insulated you from love. Because we can't just close off a a particular portion of our feelings. If we kill the dark ones, the painful ones, we kill the other ones as well. And some of us have closed off our lives to the potential of actually believing that life could be good. This is the promise of the resurrection. Not just that if you pray a prayer, you can sneak into heaven when you die. It's the belief that when you surrender your life to Jesus and stop trying to do it all on your own, when you decide that you are going to connect with and commune with God, instead of being cynical about everything and everyone around you, your heart opens up and you begin to see possibilities you didn't even know existed before. You begin to experience love and connection you didn't believe were available to you. Scripture calls it salvation. The thief on the cross calls it paradise. We might call it heaven. It's this thing that we invite into our hearts that lives within us and then we live within it when we die. Maybe you're here today to let go of all of the striving and trying to hang on. Maybe today is your day of surrender. Would you do me a favor and just close your eyes, bow your heads in this moment? There's nothing magical about it, it just helps you focus. And I want you to think about your life. The reason God brings us into this place is so that we have the opportunity to think about where we are and where we've been and where we're going. And some of us avoid moments like this because we don't want to know where we're going. Because we don't like the state of our existence. Maybe some of you are in here today and you were brave enough to admit, my life is not working. And if you knew what happened to me, you would, you would agree I have the right to be cynical. But I'm also miserable. Only Jesus can fix that disconnect within you. Now, only Jesus can be trusted in the way that you need to trust to be saved. Do not let the fact that other people proved not to be trustworthy to convince you that God is just like them because he isn't. Jesus is wholly unique and that he loves you unconditionally and that he can be trusted no matter what and that he wants to lead you into life to the full. And if you're in a place today where you're like, man, I I need that, I want you to do something brave. I want you to just slip your hand up. I want to pray for you in these final few moments of our service. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you. I just want to see who I'm praying for. If you're at this place where you're like, I need to surrender my life to something bigger than me that loves me and has the power to heal me. I see your hands, and more importantly, God does. I'm going to say a prayer over all of us today. But if you raise the hand, or maybe your heart is too broken to do that, but you know you should have, I want you to pray along in your heart just a simple prayer of like, God, I need you to come into my life and to take over, to heal me and forgive me and make me well again. And those of you that are sitting around, others who may have raised a hand, would you just pray in your heart that God would be present with them and powerful to them, that today would be the day that changes everything. Let's pray. God, we we just admit that we need you. God, we are broken people. 
who have been hurt and who have done our fair share of hurting. God, we have done destructive and self-destructive things to survive this world. In a way, we are all criminals. God, we have a reason, a justification to be cynical because our heart has been broken again and again and again. Our trust has been let down and shattered again and again and again. But today is a different day. Today is a day not of cynicism, but of surrender, of opening our hearts and throwing up our hands and just saying like, God, I can't continue doing this over and over again. I can't keep putting my trust in myself because I let me down. I can't keep putting my trust in other people and thinking they're gonna save me or a political party or some sort of organization that's gonna rescue me. God, I need you. I need my creator who when he looks at me does not see all of the bad that I have done. He sees a masterpiece, a creature that he created, that he loves unconditionally that he wants to rescue and forgive and bring to a place of freedom. God, you died so that we could have life, not just in eternity, but in the here and now. And God, I pray that as we crack the door of our heart to you, that you would enter in, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us the paradise-like peace that only you can bring, that we would have a sense that you are near, that you are here, that you are with us, that you are for us, that your love is big enough to resurrect the most dead and broken parts of us. And today we would celebrate as the day of our salvation, the end of our cynicism and the beginning of our eternal surrender. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Can we give a huge hand for the people who surrender their lives to Jesus? church isn't for them. They just don't see the point. It's not hard to see why. It is sin, not that point. It's this life has come to us. You're walking by the gates of hell. Ever found yourself thinking we'd all be better off without religion? Here's the crazy part. Jesus agrees with you. Losing my religion
What an incredible service. Can we, can we just give it up for Adam and every volunteer and the worship team? Thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us this Easter Sunday. The biggest thing that we want to do today is invite you back next week. We are kicking off a brand new series, which you just got to see a sneak preview of, called Losing My Religion. And that's not even the only thing going on next week. We also have something called Bounce Back Sunday going on. We're going to have all kinds of bounce houses and ball pits for your kids or you to play on during service, after service. I don't know how passionate you are about ball pits. But we wanted to invite you, all of your friends, to come back and hang out with us. But if today in the message or at any point in the service or just in your life, you feel like something was stirring up within you, and maybe you decided to say yes to Jesus today, and if that is you or you're somewhere in between, I want to invite you over to our prayer corner. It's right over here where we have a ton of really incredible volunteers who would love to listen to you and pray alongside you and give you resources. Specifically, we would love to gift you with a free Bible that looks just like this with a reading plan in it as long as and also contact information of like who am I supposed to talk to and ask questions but if you're like this is my first time I'm not gonna go talk to a bunch of strangers in a corner I totally get it I am I understand <laughs> I want you to take the gray card on the seat back in front of you that says next steps and this is a no human contact required way to just let us know I said yes to Jesus, or I'm curious about next steps, and this lets us follow up with you and give you those resources, so you can fill that out with your name, a way to contact you, and just drop it off at the Connect counter before you leave. We hope to see you next Sunday. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us, we hope you have an incredible week.